So does your bank help? Get my startup off the ground? F&B does. Oh, okay. With the first business zero account. But you've got a job. Office hours, pay for my after hours. Ah, you mean side hustle. No, my business. And that's why I have a business account that has zero monthly account fee. All my swipes are free. Plus, I get data from F&B too. Wow. Wow is getting paid anyway. Work that hustle. I told you, it's not a hustle. It's a business. And that's why I'm with a business bank. Okay, I hear you. Does your bank help you start your business like that? Mine does. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to you all wonderful entrepreneurs and supporters of entrepreneurs. Welcome to the I Am An Entrepreneur Summit in proud association with First National Bank and our other partners, CIFA, Renault, Google, ShopRite, and the NYDA. My name is Matsi Mudise. I am an entrepreneur as well and an entrepreneurship activist. So excited to be part of this journey of sharing stories of entrepreneurship in South Africa. To give you a little bit of context as to why we are here, all I have to say is 2020. Remember 2020? I don't think anybody will ever forget that year, especially for entrepreneurs, it was very hard. Personally, I lost friends, I lost family members, but I know of a lot of people and a lot of entrepreneurs that have to close down their shops. But we are entrepreneurs, we are creators, we are resilient, we make something out of nothing, and we fall, pick ourselves up, fail fast and fail forward. The summit's theme is the art of reinvention. And as an entrepreneur, you constantly have to be reinventing yourself. Today, we'll focus on how do you navigate this very complex space where you're constantly having to pivot and find interesting business models that will fit the new way of business. We also, as our audience, would like for you to engage with us. We want you to send us your comments, how you're feeling, and also just share some notes of inspiration. If you are joining us via Facebook or YouTube, please leave, uh, post some. Um, please join the conversation by posting on the comment section. To tweet, tweet us on at I A E S A. Hashtag IAAE Summit. And for those who are on our data free system, please send us a WhatsApp on 078 350 Now, to set the scene, we are going to have a conversation with our founder, Andile Kumalo, and he's going to tell us his personal stories of reinvention. Take it away, AK. So reinvention for me has meant a lot of things in my career. Um, there's been a lot of uh, moments and journeys that I've had to take that were not always kind of pre-planned or kind of foreseen even. And the first one that comes to mind for me is moving from kind of running an investment business to eventually running an operational business and then back to running an investment business. So for those that know, I started my career earlier on as an investment banker at Investec. And in that environment, you're doing M&A transactions, you're doing disposals, you were advising clients, you do valuations. And then my first real job was actually running an operational business, um, which was a courier company, a company that I bought into out in Kempton Park with another partner of mine, Solly. And I ran the business for just over two years and that was a very operational business. There's vehicles are involved, logistics. Uh, wake up in the morning, late nights, things go wrong all the time, so client deliveries. Uh, you're always selling, et cetera, but you know, you're paying salaries every week. Um, you're doing all sorts of things that operational people do. And then straight after getting out of that business and joining MSG Africa, there I was now running an investment business uh, where we're raising capital from funders, we're deploying it into businesses that we invest in. And your job is to provide kind of strategic guidance and support to MDs and CEOs of these businesses. You're not running it kind of from day to day. The thing that you're running day to day is an investment business, which is very different. You're managing a balance sheet, you're negotiating funding terms, you're forever reading legal agreements. Um, you know, when the markets change, you kind of have to look at your facilities again. You're supporting those businesses. So you're kind of close, but you're a little bit far. And then, you know, back in about 2006, 2007, 
when we won our first uh, radio license at Capricorn FM, uh, we now were back to getting closer to a business where Simpiwe, one of my partners, had to move to Pulukwana to go and start the radio station and run it. And although Given and I here in Joburg were still somewhat of investors, we actually had our first business that had to be run day to day. And that, that was different because when Power FM followed, it was very similar. And in fact, although I started still as kind of Chief Investment Officer of MSG Africa at the time, I eventually had to take over as a Managing Director of Power FM. And again, back to running a business kind of day to day. Why? Because the circumstances just did. It got to a point where one of us had to run the day, the, the business rather, from a day to day perspective. So all of this kind of changes in my life, as I say, you know, not all of it was pre-planned, um, but you had to move from being very far from the businesses to kind of waking up every day and literally like a shopkeeper opening the shop and letting the business operate and late at night kind of closing and shutting down the shop. And that constant shift between those two uh, kind of behaviors and, and kind of the way I did business was a big kind of lesson for me about just how when things change as a business person, as an entrepreneur, you need to be prepared for that reinvention. So my second reinvention story is a bit of a funny one. So here we are, we've got Power FM going and uh, it's a normal day, you know, back in the office, I'm already MD of the radio station, so I'm very close to the operation now. And um, it's getting close to the afternoon and it's time for all the afternoon programming. And with the drive show, of course, at the time we had the business show that started at five o'clock. And our business show host at the time calls in around 3.30, something to four and says, listen, I'm very ill and I'm not gonna be able to make it onto the show. And to cut a long story short, as with all programming issues, I go to Given, I say, Mkari, our, pro, our presenter can't come. And he says, you know, dog, as he would do. And he lights up his cigarette and we go to the balcony. He says, you know, I've been meaning to talk to you about this thing and he keeps puffing away. I'm like, talk to me about what? We need to find a, a stand-in presenter. And he says, you know, I really think you should do the show. I'm like, what? He says, I've been meaning to talk to you about this thing. We now have an opportunity with the presenter not being able to just go stand in and see how you feel afterwards. I'm like, there's no way I'm gonna do this. What do you mean? What do I know about presenting radio? I mean, I love the medium, I love the media, but no, I've never been behind the microphone before. This thing's for experts, I can't. And he, he pretty much convinced me to do it. And I guess I had a bit of confidence in being able to do it because one, I'm not shy with public speaking, but two, I love the content because I love business, right? So I read the news every day. I was interested in listed businesses. I was interested in what's happening in the economy and in the market. So there wasn't much in the show in terms of the content that I didn't know I didn't love. So I figured, you know, I could probably wing it. So I kind of winged it on the day and probably the next day. And three years later, I was still presenting Power Business. So my third moment of reinvention in my career is something that happened recently. So in my world recently is a few years ago, right? So in 2007, near the end of the year, um, I was just thinking about kind of like my next chapter in life. And I was approaching 40 years old. I was still 39 at the time, kind of holding on to my 30s, you know? And I was just at a stage of my life where I thought, what I want to do, what is it that I wanted to do next? And that kind of conversation with self led to the next reinvention. Um, so now I had to reinvent from this guy who's able to kind of garner partnerships and, and look after things with other people around at the main thing to, to setting up essentially a, a family investment office with investments at an underlying level and operations, but with management teams that run those businesses on a day to day. And all I am there for is to support them. So it's kind of like merging that history of running investments and the little story I, tell you, I told you earlier on about being in the investments and operating them. So now that I've run businesses kind of every day like the shopkeeper and I've managed investments, I thought I'm ready for this stage of my life where um, I'm sitting at the top with all the autonomy. So I found kind of merging those two worlds and mer merging those two experiences of my career really fulfilling. And that's the chapter and journey that I'm in right now. So in all these three phases of reinvention, what have I learned? I've learned that change is the only constant. What an amazing story. We call him AK and I think he is a king of Somebody that I've had the pleasure of working with him for many, many years. And one thing I know is that AK is passionate about entrepreneurs and how they can we really do want you to be part of this conversation and for those of you who are joining us on YouTube and Facebook please keep posting your comments um, in the comment section via Twitter at IAAE Summit and the hashtag is at IAAE Summit. Well and those of you who are joining us via the data stream send us a WhatsApp on 078 
We as an organization have also had to reinvent ourselves. We had to create a new normal. And today we are not just coming out of the studio here in Johannesburg. We are being joined by entrepreneurs in Durban. Warza Durban. Welcome, welcome. Hey Durban, we see you, we see you, we see you, we see you Durban. And we will hear from you later on, but stay put, enjoy, and also be part of the conversation. We are going to take a little break. Uh, and when we come back, we are going to be joined by Jeremy Maggs. Looking forward to that. Hey, does your bank give you a guide on how to run your business? Yep, it's on Fundaba, which puts all I can learn about business. Right here. Yeah. Fun what? Fundab. It's proper help on how to run my business. It's free on my FNB app, so I can learn on the go. Oh, like little tips. I wouldn't call learning how to get my pricing right to turn profits in one year little. Mm, what's the catch? No catch. They just want my business to do well. Hmm, that's really something. Does your bank put a business coach in your hand? Mine does. didn't have to drive here. The all-new Renault Triber. Space for everything. Renault, most fuel-efficient brand in SA. Welcome back, welcome back to the I Am Entrepreneur Summit in proud association with First National Bank. Viewpoint is coming up, but first, let me check if there are some comments from our audience. Wow. It doesn't look like anybody's commenting. I do encourage you to engage with us because we are here for you as, on, as, as entrepreneurs. We want to hear, we have amazing speakers. They're going to be sharing a lot of thoughts. So we really also want to tap into you, even though you can't be with us in person. Well, have you ever had to change direction in your business? Um, as an entrepreneur, you constantly have to be reinventing yourself. You'll be challenged with different problems. Each and every day, you have to set your mind in ensuring that you are answering and you're responding to questions that your clients are having. So I'm very, very excited to be introducing this new segment called Viewpoint, and it's going to be hosted by Jeremy Maggs. I mean, Jeremy Maggs is one of those TV personalities, anchors that I have admired since I was a young girl, and I'm so honored to be working with him on this wonderful, um, wonderful project. Uh, I am an entrepreneur. In Viewpoint, we'll get to get a perspective of what really goes in into the entrepreneur's mind, and Jeremy will be able to unpack that for us. Let's join Jeremy. A very warm welcome. Our key purpose, our core purpose here at I Am An Entrepreneur is to be the fuel that helps entrepreneurs build and grow their business. I like that word fuel because the fuel makes us all a whole lot better. Viewpoint is a program that seeks to package, to unlock, understand, and deal with the challenges that successful people have faced and also the perils that they have faced as entrepreneurs. We're going to discuss topics such as innovation and reinventing, dealing with failure, and also managing performance, and the art, the all-important art of leadership. Our two guests today know all about having to innovate out of necessity. Innovate out of necessity, that is a key phrase. I want to welcome Gugan Kabinda, brand strategist, solutions architect, and the trailblazing founder of the uh, underwear or undergarment company, because she'll tell us she's expanded, uh, Gugu Intimates, along with Professor Rodney Ganga, head of academic development for the uh, WITS Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment, also founder uh, of uh, the academic uh, startup, the East African Institute of Machining Manufacturing Research. It is so nice to welcome the two of you to the program today. Gugu. I know the story because you and I have spoken on many occasions before, but let's dive into it. What made you start the organization? But more importantly, I want to explore where the spark of innovation came from. 
So I love how you emphasized um, innovation out of necessity because I think uh, it, became, it becomes a question of necessity to whom, right? And for me, something like underwear was considered something cosmetic at the time. And I actually wore a white shirt on purpose today because it's actually one of those, the, that was the spark for me um, that spoke to why undergarments need to be more functional. Than I know, the, it's the your support. old party trick, I know. The yes, way. it's my old party trick with a white shirt, don't fall for it. <laughs> <laughs> So for me, um, the spark came when I, as a female, could not find a nude shade of underwear that complemented my skin tone. Mm -hmm. And I think the challenge um, in innovation comes in whether you're okay with unknowing that question after you ask it. So once you ask the question, if you can match your makeup, why can't you match your underwear? It becomes quite hard to unsee. It was almost as though the question started to become in my face. And being the solutions architect I've, I've, I've known myself to be over the years, I started to ask the question as to why that was so. Mm. And I, the why that was so just made it impossible for me to not just do it. But the other eureka moment was in realizing what the difference between the underwear that existed mm -hmm. and what I wanted to create was. Then it was like, okay, so just take the gap. Rodney, it's possible. we've just met, so I'm not going to ask you a question about underwear. Please. Um, I just think that would be awkward for all concerned. But what I am going to ask you, and it is a serious question, you're trying to shape innovation. You want to be a thought leader in innovation on the continent. How are you trying to shift development, and why are you doing it? Uh, mine starts in 2013. Um, Finishing, I finished my master's, started my PhD in materials engineering. And the reason I went into a postgraduate into materials engineering is because it's a space where we're able to take advantage of minerals around us, because Africa is mineral rich. But one of the biggest challenges we've had is how do we beneficiate it? And you find that you can take it out of the ground, but it's, you have to send it somewhere where somebody else will process it and convert it to an element that's... It's an age-old argument. Yes, you know. Yep. But I had a life-shaking moment when I traveled to Austria for a conference, and the opening speaker was this global leader. He's called Professor Harman, and he gives an economic presentation. He doesn't give it in terms of what we're doing in our research. In 2013, at the time, Africa population is about just about 1 billion people. And he says, come 2050, we will double in numbers. And it shook me like a ton of bricks twice the number of people on this continent with the resources we have, we have a real issue. Because, yes, we can educate enough people to go out into industry, but it's still not enough. So I decided, you know what, let's look at it from a big, bigger perspective. How do we educate people to innovate? How do we create access to industry where the innovation can be produced? How do you create market for them to access, but also how do you give them access to capital? And that's what sparked the generation of the institute we are developing and building. Is innovation in a person inherent or can you teach it? Innovation is intuitive to this continent. Literally, if you go to any urban or even rural area, you'll always find somebody making a plan. Typically. Intuitive by necessity. Yes, by yeah. necessity. You, you know, you don't have all the resources, but you make a plan. And now if you can educate on how people can capitalize on this in that gift that we have, put it in a space where they've got access to a market. How do we create an environment where this can be successful that can translate into manufacturing? Because if you don't manufacture, you will never grow a developing world into a developed structure. You just can't get around it. And that's what we're targeting to develop and enhance. How did you bridge the gap then between innovation and then the stuff that you had to do? I think firstly, before you even get into figuring out the steps and finding the wherewithal to follow through, is you've got to make, it's got to be a big enough problem. So often is the responsibility around the innovation that, that will drive you through. What happens next is a series of research, is a series of inquiries, a series of, actually, for me, the blessing of corporate experience, to be honest, knowing how to then collect all that information and put it into place. So, and systemize um, it. And systemize yeah. it. The, the systemizing of it, and we take for granted how much we need to teach structural thinking so that you even know how to place any problem mm. within that. Do you know what I mean? Teaching people how to think, how to um, know when the next step is so that regardless of the problem, then we can... We so, Rodney, Google has given us an impressive list. In teaching the process of taking innovation to market, in your experience then, where are the deficiencies? How does one even teach innovation? Already we have the natural gift. Everywhere, look, literally everybody makes a plan. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can recognize that need, the next thing is how do you access a solution that is repeatable and reliable? 
then how do you access a market that will be able to make this available to that? And then how do you put an economic value to what you're trying to build? And lastly, how you keep it within an environmental friendly space, because I'm in the engineering space. So we always look at how do you keep it safe and sustainable in terms of how you build that up. Thank All you. right, in terms of this conversation, let's assume now that we're at base camp. Yeah. Yes. So things have started to, to move. Mm. All of a sudden, there's a seismic shift. Something happens COVID. to rock the boat, precisely. COVID happens. COVID <laughs> happens. So let's look at it academically and let's look at it practically. How did you deal with it? For me, something as big as COVID shook me to the way in which um, I was already getting the kind of um, insights, watching neighbors around me inside Rosebank Mall, for example, closing down before COVID. And I started to question whether it is entirely practical to keep insisting on a hardcore brick and mortar retail model when the overheads are so high. So when do you start doing business? I was primarily as a marketer insistent on building a brand, a B2C brand, get people to demand the product and then start to look at how retailers would take on and, and want to satisfy that demand. I just didn't know when when was, you know? COVID showed me that it's actually now because immediately after that and the retail environment changed, we got our first retailer coming forward to say, listen, everyone's shopping online now, come on board. We, you've built the brand, we need to let them know they can find you with us. So What's your sense in dealing with those seismic shifts? Is there, a, is there a template? Is there a blueprint? Well, I like templates, so I'm a dangerous person to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> but to be honest with you, the reason you were even able to innovate in the first place was your ability to think differently. And also, one must also be prepared to cut losses. Mm. You might realize that this was something that I really wanted to do. It's not working anymore. Kill your darlings. In yes. Words, yeah. One also needs to look again, do you understand your market? Mm. Do you understand who you're trying to reach and who you're trying to engage with? And what I mean by this is there are certain products within Africa, whether it rains gold, whether it snows, this is a resource. By investing in those, the social cultural good because you help build those economies, but also at the same time, you put yourself in a space mm. where you'll always be relevant. Very quickly, how do you determine when the pivot has worked? Is there a yardstick? Is there a measurement mm -hmm. on what the pivot is? Or is that, is that like measuring smoke? Well, again, I'm coming from an engineering yeah. background. You sort of put checks and balances yeah. in terms of what you're trying to achieve. Having a set of tools that can help you measure your objectives mm -hmm. keeps you in line in terms of that. Do you have that set of tools? Final question. How you determine whether the pivot has worked is when you look at those primary kind of measurement um, kind of points. Mm. Is it sales? Is it, um, so for sometimes if it was brand health, then don't go and beat yourself down over other people's success measures when yours for that particular period was, for example, just to have a stronger brand, just to connect better. So being clear about what it is that you're going to do within a particular period, and for me, that has become, um, those tools have really become listening. Um, we throw around the term social listening so much, but there is so much value in not sitting in a little um, hole and, and thinking that you did that profile of your consumer and you know who they are. Mm. They're changing every day just like you. So looking at my data consistently, looking at my stock, looking at my inventory. And uh, Rodney got very excited when you mentioned the word data, but we're not <laughs> going to talk about it. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Guggen Kabinda and Professor Rodney Ganga. Thank you so much for adding an enormous amount of value to this important debate of entrepreneurship in South Africa and on the continent. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Those are such wonderful insights from Africa to the world. Prof Genga and Gugu, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and experiences around innovation in Africa, having to pivot, and just being an entrepreneur. We know that it's very, very difficult um, to wake up in the morning and you constantly have to be knowing what is your why. And Gugu, thank you very much for also normalizing Underway, the business of Underway. Well done to both of you for taking your place um, in our entrepreneurial ecosystem. When we come back uh, after the break, we would love to hear your thoughts. We would love for you to engage. We would love for you to tell us about how you've had to pivot. Pivot is a very interesting word that became 
very popular last year because everybody had to do things differently. From what you were used to, the world had to change. So we would love to hear your stories about how you've had to pivot and also how are you gearing yourself for the next wave of business opportunities. Well, to do this, we would like for you to do it on our YouTube and Facebook Live, posting in the comments section, and then via Twitter at IAAESA using the hashtag IAAE Summit. And for those of you who are on our data free stream, we would like for you to send us a WhatsApp on 078 350 well, we are about to take a break and we look forward to seeing you after this. So does your bank help? Get my startup off the ground? f and does. Oh, okay. With the first business zero account. But you've got a job. Office hours, pay for my after hours. Ah, you mean side hustle. No, my business. And that's why I have a business account that has zero monthly account fee. All my swipes are free. Plus, I get data from FB2. Wow. Wow is getting paid anyway. Work that hustle. I told you, it's not a hustle. It's a business. And that's why I'm with a business bank. Okay, I hear you. Does your bank help you start your business like that? Mine does. Turn left in 100 meters. I don't need that. Dad, 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 turn left. <laughs> welcome back, welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed your slight little break. I'm going to read some of the comments that um, our audiences have been sharing with us. Um, and I believe there is, a qu uh, there is a comment in Durban. Coming, crossing over to Durban. All right, cool. Well, we apologize for that technical, well, technical we glitch. That it's also very difficult for me to say it. Uh, we're going to try again. Uh, going to Durban. Going to try again. Going to Durban. Hi, my name is Makosi Msimango. I run a business in the tourism industry. Uh, my question is, how does one gain technical. consumer... Technical. How does one gain consumer confidence into back into your product uh, because in the tourism industry we were hit hard with the COVID and now the issue is and um, as we pivot and come up with innovative ways we are struggling to regain the consumer confidence into utilizing the products and utilizing our services thank you Thank you very much, Durban. We appreciate that question and we appreciate the love. We're really getting a lot of comments from um, our, our audiences all over the country and we'll definitely make sure that the questions that you ask will be answered by our panelists who will be joining us later. Well, the next segment is, let, it's the word of mouth. Let your work speak for itself. That is what word of mouth is. You are as good as your last service and as your last product. So it's very, very important that the sentiment that your customers carry are the ones that are actually going to be doing your organic promotion as a business. If you would like to be featured on um, our next word of mouth, we would definitely love for you to write to us and we would like to hear from you. We would like for you to tell us who you are, what your business does, why it is that we have to feature you, and what it is you want people to know about your product and your service. And to do this, we'd love for you to email us on at uh, info at iamanentrepreneur.co.za. My name is Bella. Um, my shop is called Flowers and Things. We are a fresh flowering gift store. 
So we reinvented ourselves basically by staying positive and by keeping our clients informed on WhatsApp. And then during COVID, it was more deliveries. So instead of people coming in, people were phoning, ordering by WhatsApp and our social media platform. My name is Bella Costa, and I am an entrepreneur. Hello everyone, my name is Tando. I am the co-founder of Cream Duke Lab and I'm also a dentist by profession. Cream Duke Lab is a business that offers premium homemade ice creams, cupcakes and cakes. We launched the business in September 2020. How the business is conceived is that my husband and I's obsession for ice cream heightened over the lockdown 2020 period and was also spending more time in the kitchen. So we figured, why can't two MBA brains launch a business? And that's exactly what we did. Because of my profession as a dentist, we're very intentional that we cannot launch products that have high sugar content. And that's exactly the feedback we've been getting from our lovely customers. We've been very fortunate over the past few months to cater to individuals and businesses. And we're hoping to leave more people with smiles on their faces as they taste our exciting products, such as this ice cream. I am Tando and I am an entrepreneur. My name is Tiffa Mukoro. Uh, my business is Molly's Third. We are a food and beverage company. Basically, we deal with uh, catering, corporate functions, food styling, private dinners, events, and so on. My biggest learning in reinvention, I'd say by having a website and being active on social media. And uh, the reason why I say it's reinvention because you are reaching out through different platforms. I am Tefu Mukhoro. I am an entrepreneur. Watch out world, these are entrepreneurs that are going to take South Africa by storm. And as indicated, if you want to be featured on our word of mouth feature, we would love for you to email us on at info at iamanentrepreneur.co.za. Just to reflect on some of the wonderful love that we're getting around the, the country and our audiences. Faith Mkomi saying love the content and it's so relevant. Thank you. We also have Tsehofato Sibulao. Reinvention is key, some great lessons so far. And then we also, Tseho Faso says, SA needs more platforms like I am an entrepreneur to continue building and supporting our entrepreneurs and share valuable information so that we can all grow. Our next segment is on the bookshelf. To be an entrepreneur, you have to literally be a bookworm because you need to know what's going on, what's happening. Tap into the minds of great innovators, great entrepreneurs, and to draw some inspiration from some of their journeys and biographies of famous entrepreneurs. Up next is Hulisani Ravele, and she will be sitting down with Owetu Shabani. She is a phenomenal woman. She is going to tell us about how she balances life, how she balances being an entrepreneur, and also she is the founder of Art of Superwoman. Take it away, ladies. Uh, we're in the new for Sunny Ravere, and welcome to On the Bookshelf, where I will be in conversation with fellow entrepreneurs to gain insights and learnings into some of their favorite books, the books that have shaped who they are as individuals and as business owners as well. My guest is the founder of Art of Superwoman, a woman that is all about power. She is bold. And if there's one person that has understood reinvention, it's this girl right here. All the way to Lishavane. Welcome to On the Bookshelf. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Huli. Girl, when it comes to reading, for me, I think the power comes in being able to lose yourself in a book that either sometimes reflects itself back to you yeah. or has some of those nuggets that you're like, man, I never thought of it, about it like that. What is reading to you? What does it mean to you? Yeah, I, I love reading books where I, I kind of get the feel of at the end of this book, what do I want to achieve? Mm. Um, or what do I want to have known? Or what do I not want to take away? And I read with uh, highlighters. <laughs> Me too. You know, <laughs> and a notebook. What do you think the importance is for entrepreneurs to read? You know, do you think it's different for a person who's in business that reading should kind of like be a critical 
thing that you do? I do believe so. Um, whether it's a book, whether it's researching online, whether you're reading a magazine or you're reading a book, but schedule those dates for yourself, especially as an entrepreneur, to kind of catch up and be in the know of what everyone else is doing. Then let's talk first about this book that I honestly think every <laughs> single entrepreneur, I haven't read this one you haven't yet, read but it. <laughs> most have, you, have. you know, Shoe Dog, Phil Knight, the man behind the swoosh, Tell me more about this book. You know, if I were to summarize what the book is about, having a vision and allowing everyone to play their part in how we all get there. Um, and anyone who's, who's read the book will, will know the story of how um, the funder walks out with him from the, um, from the bank and says, oh, you know, basically tells the bank like, are you seriously gonna fire this dream? Like, are you hearing yourselves? And then as he walks out, he's on some, like, I, I, he hates small-minded people. He's like, I, I hate people that actually think, think, think everything is about money. Not everything is about money. And this is the very same person who's like, who then becomes one of his biggest funders, you know? Um, and not everything is about money, but we're all in it to make money yeah. to some extent, right? But not everything is about money. Sometimes it's about the vision. So we go from this book to this one over here, which is Women Who Run With The Wolves. Like, girl. <laughs> This is an old book, but Women Who Run With The Wolves talks about harnessing your inner power as a woman, harnessing that innate ability that we're all born with, and kind of using, or not using that, but allowing the natural way in which women move and women do things. To be your power. Our instinct to be your power. Yep. Own it, be it. Um, stop allowing the world to kind of taint your view on life and the, we're, we're wild. Like, we are just innately these like fierce beings. It sounds like such a book of affirmation because mm -hmm. like you're saying, as women and especially in business, you know, it's, we've always had this ability in us, but the world yeah. is almost like they were never ready for us to take charge, for us to have these wild dreams and to run wild Absolutely. as a wolf would, right? Mm. And that's what we're usually told, right? Like, it's just masculine spaces, you know? You can't, <laughs> don't you bring can't, your feelings don't, here. Don't You're so feelings. emotional. Listen, Are you okay? I'm, yeah. I am gonna bring my feelings here. <laughs> yeah. There's one more book that I would love to speak about. You said it's Living Beyond Our Feelings by yeah. Joyce Meyer. I mean, speak yeah. to me more about that book. The frustrations of working in corporate and and then coming home to an entrepreneurial husband and then like there's kids and then at some point we had two under two. <laughs> you, you, you struggle to, to balance how you feel with how, what needs to be done. Mm. So that, that book really unpacked that for me so beautifully in living beyond your feelings because we are feelers naturally as women, like yeah. the wild woman. We're feelers, but they, there are ways in which we can process these feelings and live beyond the feelings. Um, and really, I think our feelings, if channeled in the right direction, could heal the world. Wow. Oloetu, thank you so much for joining me on The Bookshelf and for sharing these amazing reads. I'm literally headed to the bookstore to get all three. No jokes, I kid you not. Um, I think what's really touched me the most is how you have shared books that are, they touch on so many aspects of who we are as a people first and the fact that we mustn't put our businesses ahead of who we are yeah. as a person because if you're not grounded and okay as self, anything that you're about to build is going to break because you're broken. So. Absolutely. You're a G girl. May <laughs> money follow you. I know we are a tanda. <laughs> May you be blessed. And don't stop reading. <laughs> Thank don't you. Stop reading. Ladies, ladies, thank you so much for sharing those wonderful insights. As I said, as an entrepreneur, you have to be a bookworm. You do better when you know better. Knowledge is power. One of the things that I do as an entrepreneur is I always subscribe to what the famous um, successful entrepreneurs read. I think by sharing some of their knowledge and insights, it's important to know what they have been reading and also the experiences that they can share in some of their biographies. So as entrepreneurs, I encourage you to read, read, read and read some more and also follow some of these successful for entrepreneurs by reading their biographies. Our partner knows all about assisting um, small businesses, the First National Bank, at any stage of your business cycle. Let's discover how FMB can help you with your next pivot. I'm Tepon Tlamele supply and development product manager at F&D Business. Entrepreneurs should start thinking differently about their businesses because 
the world is going to be different forever. We don't know how long the effects of the pandemic and the new way of doing the world or doing work is going to be with us. So that would mean entrepreneurs will need to adapt technology or adopt technology in the use of their businesses in order to stay relevant and stay in their minds of their customers and potential customers as well. So reinvention is one, being able to stay relevant and most importantly, being able to continue and sustain growth uh, despite the disruption in the world going forward. F&B can help businesses reinvent themselves um, through our Fundaba platform that we've launched that's on the F&B business app. So it's important in reinventing themselves, businesses remain true to their strategic intent and think about their uh, strategic objectives um, and reinvent themselves and think about how relevant they are to their current customers. So F&B Business Fundaba has a number of very important modules that help you firstly think about your business in a much better way, which would include modules that focus on helping entrepreneurs build a strategy and building key objectives and how to measure a successful strategy for their business. So once uh, businesses have a relevant business that's appropriate to the time and context and customers that they seek to serve, it is then easier for the bank to be able to assist in other ways like putting them on non-financial support programs, mentorship, business coaching um, initiatives we have through our enterprise and supplier development offerings, and also through unlock, helping them unlock financial or funding opportunities through financial support offered through um, the SME development strategy. To use Fundaba, you do not have to be an FNB customer. However, the offering is offered on the FNB platform, the FNB business app. Um, you would then need to have a profile on the app, but you don't necessarily need to be a customer. What I would like to share to all entrepreneurs, it's important for them to understand that funding follows really good entrepreneurial ideas. So it's very important to for you to be really thinking carefully about your business, making sure that it's relevant to the time and the context, and to be relevant to the future. So, you know, the better entrepreneurial ideas will always be able to attract funding. Businesses that fail to adapt and change to the current context and remain relevant will most likely not be able to attract funding or attract any sort of financial support from financial institutions, sources of funding for their businesses. So the art of reinvention becomes a way of doing life. Hey, does your bank give you a guide on how to run your business? Yep, it's on Fundaba, which puts all I can learn about business right here. Fun what? Fundaba. It's proper help on how to run my business. It's free on my FNB app, so I can learn on the go. Oh, like little tips? I wouldn't call learning how to get my pricing right to turn profits in one year little. Mm, what's the catch? No catch. They just want my business to do well. Hmm. That's really something. Does your bank put a business coach in your hand? Mine does. A true banker of the entrepreneur, FMB is truly a bank that supports ideas and also innovation. Well, we've traveled a long journey with um, FMB. It's a, they've been very, very involved in growing entrepreneurs, supporting the ecosystem, supporting accelerators, nonprofits, and research. So FMB really knows how to walk the talk. Our next segment after the break will be the blue chair. And our founder, Andile Kumalo, will be having a conversation with the founder and CEO of Corium Skincare, Wui Zondi. You definitely don't want to miss this segment. So does your bank help? Get my startup off the ground? F&B does. Oh, okay. With the first business zero account. But you've got a job. Office hours, pay for my after hours. Ah, you mean side hustle. No, my business. And that's why I have a business account that has zero monthly account fee, all my swipes are free, plus I get data from FMB too. Wow. Wow is getting paid anyway. Work that hustle. I told you, it's not a hustle, it's a business. And that's why I'm with a business bank. Okay, I hear you. Does your bank help you start your business like that? Mine does. Oh, it's mom. Are we driving? Oh, no, dad, it's hands free. Hey, honey, don't forget the move. Oh, okay, honey, thank you.
Welcome back, welcome back, wonderful people. I would love to just thank you for sharing the love. Um, reading the comments from our audiences, people are really enjoying the inputs from Prof Genga and Gugu. Marvin Cohen, loving this content. Innovation through necessity, very informative, great segment. Lee Bug, we hear you. This is for this is very informative. Thank you, Gugu and Prof Genga. We want we want more and more of you to contribute to this, especially asking questions because in our next segments we'll be having a wonderful panelists. Uh, they'll be sharing a lot of pearls of wisdom, and we would love for you to be able to um, tap into their brains and ask our great entrepreneurs some questions. About the blue chair, well, you could never hear enough stories about entrepreneurs because most of the times we're always reading about the success stories. We never really know the hassles, the bustles. We never really know about when they wanted to break down and when they wanted to give up as entrepreneurs. So what I love about the blue chair is tapping into the mind of the entrepreneur, sharing their journey, sharing their stories, sharing their fears. Because at the end of the day, these are human beings as well that had big ideas, but they went before, beyond having just ideas, they actually started their businesses. So we are going to have today, um, Vui Zondi, I'm quite excited, a phenomenal female entrepreneur. Our paths did cross once upon a time. She did tell me that when I met her in the makeup room earlier on, and it's interesting how as entrepreneurs, we are a tribe. And she's going to be telling us about her business that she built, uh, Corium Skincare, which is all about personal care, which is in the personal uh, uh, care sector. It's a rapidly growing industry. And she's going to tell us about the innovation in her business because it's all about innovation. So let's hear her thoughts on reinvention and what it takes to build a successful business. I think when we speak to reinvention, top of mind comes qualities like resilience, qualities like a strong sense of self-belief, and qualities like having a big picture mentality. And so if we speak about resilience, that's really, I think, the quality of being able to bounce back. So entrepreneurship in itself is not a science, it's not an art. I think it's a mixture of so many parts of life and so many disciplines that you really need to be quite resilient in who you are because no matter the effort that sometimes you can put in, no matter the, the precision of, you know, your decisions or how, you know, how, how well you project or how much research you put into it, sometimes things just don't work. And that's why it's important to be resilient and to know that you can bounce back from what it is that those trials that your path would teach you. And so the second quality that's really very important for your entrepreneurial journey is to be able to have a strong sense of self-belief to be able to have a strong sense of self. So entrepreneurship in itself, it, it, it's so tough on you as the person that you need to really understand why it is that you, start, you started the business and what it is that you really want to achieve with the business, right? And I think once you know those things and you know yourself, then it becomes a bit easier. It's not to say that the challenges won't be there. It's not to say that the speed bumps themselves won't be there. But it's to say that you know yourself so well that you know exactly where it is that you're going. Keeping that in mind, another very important quality, I think, for reinventing yourself is to be agile in terms of your practice, right? So yes, you know what your goals are, you know what it is that the big picture is, but you need to be agile as an entrepreneur and you need to be flexible. And that speaks to being able to be honest with yourself. If something is not working, something is not working. If something needs to be tweaked, something needs to be tweaked. If you need to maybe get in someone who has a greater expertise than you at a certain skill, then that's what you need to do. So it's very important that while you have a strong sense of self-belief, you are agile around your methods because I think being too, too, too frigid and too scientific and too, you know, like stuck in a box as an entrepreneur is something that can really, you know, taint your journey and taint your experience as an entrepreneur. I think the other thing when we speak about reinvention, and it also ties back to your self-belief, you need to be confident. You need to know who you are. You need to know what it is that you stand for. And you need to know that once you start to speak about your venture, your business, once you start to roll people in, you're also able to inspire and to enthuse them to feel the same way that you feel about your business. Because there's also a soft science around entrepreneurship which talks to then maybe the soft skills, you know? It talks to the people skills. It talks to, to the fact that 
you need to make people believe in you. So yes, the first step is that you have that strong sense of self-belief, but other people need to buy so much into your vision that even in rooms where you are not there, they will say, oh, I know Joe, he makes the best soaps. Or I know Joe, people love his soaps. And that's also one of the things that will help you whenever you would hit any sort of a challenge as an entrepreneur. And that speaks to them, the confidence that you would have when you interact with people, the confidence that you would leave people with even when you're not there. And so the other aspect to touch on is the importance of a team. So when I'm we and I'm doing everything and I'm a solopreneur, the truth is that I have strengths, I have weaknesses, I have blind spots. And so one of the things we don't speak about a lot as entrepreneurs is that you need to have a team around you, particularly when you're not as strong or in fields that you're not as strong in. And that comes to maybe also having a good sense of, of, of self understanding, right? Because there's so much that is that is spoken to about being self-reliant about you know uh, they push you grind when you're an entrepreneur but the truth is sometimes you can grind all you want but you don't have the necessary skill you don't have the necessary skill set and i think that's why it's important to then be able to have a team or to be able to have people that you can tap into to help you where you're not strong as an entrepreneur and so i think the last thing i would want to touch on um as maybe an entrepreneur and to speak to the power of reinvention, to speak about coming back from trials, you need to be a person with a positive mindset. Um, and we're not talking about toxic positivity where every day you're smiling, every day you're a ray of sunshine and you're jumpy. That's not um, particularly realistic, nor is it relatable. But you need to, to, to have a big picture mindset and you need to be positive because touching on an earlier, I think, point, part of entrepreneurship is, is being able to make others believe so much in your product or your service that they also feel as positive, they feel as happy. You, you enthuse them with an excitement about your product, about your service, so that even in opportunities where you're not there, you've left such a positive feeling around it that they feel equally confident to be able, you know, to, to speak to others about your service, about your product, and to also be able to assist you with opportunities going forward. And I think th those things all come together and they speak to the power of reinvention and they speak to resilience, you know? Um, it, it's not going to be your technical aptitude. It's not going to be intellect that makes you pivot forward as an entrepreneur. It's going to be able to have a generalist skill set. It's going to be, you know, being able to know your why, being able to communicate your why, being able to make others feel equally confident, equally positive about your why and i think those things are very very important because we tend to to speak a lot about you know doing your business model all the technical aspects and yes without those there's no business but you as the entrepreneur yourself you need to you need to be the sort of person that people feel they can invest their coins in the sort of person people feel they can give opportunity to and the sort of person people trust to be able to bring themselves up from a trial and from um, any obstacles. So another very important aspect of entrepreneurship and something that can help you to reinvent yourself, something that will assist you to come back from trials, from speed bumps, and from some of the obstacles that we face in you know, our day-to-day -day entrepreneurial lives is being able to have a good support structure. And that talks to your human and social um, capital or your human and social network, but it also talks to your environment. And I believe one of the things that has helped Korea pivot forward, even when we've had speed bumps, is the fact that we belong to an incubation hub. So if you would look around us, we actually are in four ways and we are at the River Sands Incubation Hub. And I think support is important in terms of from a technical aspect, but also from a soft skills aspect as an entrepreneur. And the very, very last point I promise now is to speak about the value chain as an entrepreneur. And I think we always think that for you to be the most impactful, to be the most effective or to be the best entrepreneur, you need to own all parts of your value chain. And that's not necessarily true. And I think if you would look at how Red Bull runs its business to say that the manufacturing component of Red Bull is totally outsourced and they concentrate on the marketing, they concentrate on how to differentiate themselves. And sometimes as an entrepreneur, especially as someone heading up a startup, you don't have the capital to own every small thing that you do or you produce. And so I would like to encourage entrepreneurs to think beyond just 
feeling that they have to own the entire value chain and to look at agile business solutions and to see what really needs to be in your support versus what could be outsourced or what you could even get freelancers to help you with. How amazing was Vui's story? I mean, I am truly and truly inspired. AK, I'm going to ask you this question. Do you agree that the future is female? I don't think I have a choice. I don't think you have a choice. Because frankly, it's obvious. It's obvious. First of all, the smartest people here are all the ladies and definitely the best looking people here are all the ladies. So thank you so much, Matsi. I feel like I've launched a TV career. And uh, I think we should negotiate some kind of a some kind of a commission for Between the rest of your Between you and career. I. Yeah, so to all the for broadcasters launching. out there. Thank you for launching. Yeah, exactly, right? So thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for the launch. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for everybody that's joining us. We are in the blue chair. Uh, my name is Andy Kumalo. I have an amazing guest. You already heard from her. First up, let me thank all the entrepreneurs that were on the word of mouth. Big ups to you guys, shout out to all of you guys standing up and putting your, yourselves out there, showing what you are able to do. And as Matthew's already said, if you guys want to be featured on this platform, info at imanentrepreneur.co.za is the email to drop, and I'm sure the team will get to you. And also to Durban, thank you so much for joining us all the way out in KZN, my, my home city, my home province. I'm very chuffed that you guys are here. But now we come to the real... Um, order of events and that is our guest today thank you so much that's very gracious of you very gracious <laughs> i am so chuffed to hear thank you now obviously you've dropped the gems we it's been very clear what you have to say about your thoughts of what's important in the art of reinvention but let's talk about you for a second and i know most entrepreneurs feel very uncomfortable talking about themselves you went into an industry that is seen to be very competitive an industry that has got big global players. Correct. Why and how did you end up thinking and believing you can compete? I think for me, Karium is really, it's a, it's a passion hobby inspired business. So if you look at my vocational background, you look at my academic background, nothing of it would speak to skin care, nothing of it would speak to personal care. But I just always was a very feminine and girly girl and I was always someone I think who had an interest in grooming. So it truly, I believe is, is you know, a hobby-inspired business. We just started making things on the stovetop. That's really it. Um, those are the beginnings of Karium. And so I think as I grew in passion for actually understanding grooming, how we take care of ourselves, that then translated into what is now a, a commercial, I think, uh, proposition of it, which is Karium. Yeah. And to then ask your question about, you know, a very saturated market. Yes, some may say. It may not be or highly competitive market, I think a big part of what's made Karium pivot, <laughs> there's that word again, yeah. um, what's made Karium pivot quite well, and I think as a startup, is the fact that we have a relatable story. Okay. And I think it's important to, to, um, to acknowledge that as South Africans, we love relatability, right? right. So that is part of what has made Corium um, coming come in, into its own because people have understood that, okay, this started when it was a side hustle. I was still working. I was a management consultant. I'd come and do this. You know, I'd make butters on the stovetop. And all those things feel you relatable. You butters on the stovetop. You don't, don't scheme over that. that. We, we want to know. know. What, what was the, the real start like? Because, because many, many people, people that are here with us from around, around the country and the world, world when, when we see, see someone, someone like you doing so well, well when we get onto your, onto onto your, your platforms, platform, especially your website, website, I love it, by the way, koreanskincare.co.za, and we want to buy your stuff, it always looks like it was an overnight success. It always looks so beautiful. So take us back to that stove. So I, I, there's no such thing as an overnight success. So let me say I haven't encountered it, right? Um, so I think what people see and what the journey is are two very d uh, different things. And it's people who are close to you that would know what, you know, what it takes to be what is seen, right? Um, and so it, it, it speaks to really time researching. So for me, one of the first things I had to research because I didn't have the academic background. I didn't right. want to find myself on the back foot. Right. I had to bring in a team. So for me, I, I, I rely very strongly in terms of the technical aspects with the right. team. So I had to find formulators, people who understand the science ah. of skincare, you know, people who understand that if I'm trying to make a product that has shelf life, what are the things that you need to put into it that still conf uh, confined to the declaration that we've made that it's natural? Do you gotcha. get what I'm saying? Gotcha. So I had to get those skills because I didn't have those skills. What I had was the hobby and, and the passion and the vision, but not 
the skill set, right? So that was the first thing that I used to do because I still had a job. Gotcha. Um, and I think then I grew in confidence and I really would always tell the story of Curry. And, and so I think that is a, a, a very big part of our value proposition, the fact mm -hmm. that we've got such a relatable story, we've got such a strong story. Mm -hmm. um, and people feel that they've grown up with Curry. The people who were there when I was still very active on Twitter, they feel that they have been a part of Curry. And I think that then speaks to the rapport we've been able to build with our consumers. And I think that is also um, something that is a differentiator for us and something that is a value proposition because yeah. our consumers believe in Corium. They believe in the story that I can have a passion and I can work and I can be diligent and around my passion work. and create a commercial success. Absolutely. So, so, so one of the things you talk about in detail in your, in your earlier clip is having the team. Correct. Obviously, when you're starting out, you don't have a lot of money to have the team. How did you hack that? Because you're right, you don't have all the skills, so you need skills from outside, but you may not be able to afford them. How did you hack that? So for me, I had to get a team uh, very early from a legal perspective. I was in consulting, you are billing a client by the hour, so I can't be doing Korean work during billable hours. So I just had to get someone. So the first person I had was someone who was doing admin, and she used to give me eight hours a week. Right, just to go into the online store and download the orders and uh, how, you know what's in each order, what is the address and everything. I'd go home, I'd write the way bill, I'd pack the order and everything. So quite early on, I had to, I, I had to get people um, because of the job that I was in. I had to declare that I now have a business and I needed to also declare that having a business is not going to interfere with my obligations to the client, right? Um, but then speaking to the team, it speaks to being able to create um, almost an ecosystem of skills. So I have a small team, but I freelance a lot. So if oh, we're sweet. going to be launching products, then I know I need to have a graphic designer. I know I, I need to have a copywriter because we're going to write blog articles around it, you know? I need to have a copywriter to actually read the product blurb on the product. Does this make sense, you know? Will a person seeing this product know that this one is suitable for me versus this one? Right. So as projects and as, as certain milestones in, you know, my entrepreneurial life happened, then the team grows or it shrinks. I see, I see. So you're saying that a way to hack that is to use these, these skills or rather to source these skills on a project basis as opposed to feel the pressure of just going to and employ them full time. Uh, true, I have very few full-time employees and I think, I mean, a lot of times we want to stand on platforms and say I have a team of 50 people, but is it 50 people that are, you are creating value for? You know, is it 50 people that you are going to be able to have a succession plan for? Yes. Um, so I think those things are very important. And when we speak to team, we speak about the sustainability of those roles. Um, we speak about the value that they're creating for you and that you're also creating for them, right? Because I think you want to, to empower your team. It's, it's yeah. not just a matter of now it's numbers yeah. and it's, a, you know, you need to actually be, be helping those Absolutely. people. Absolutely. I, mean, I guess also it talks to guys out there, it also talks to, the ecosystem of other entrepreneurs. I mean, you can find these skills in other entrepreneurs. So there's a graphic designer out there, there's a, there's a web developer out there, there's a social media manager out there. So one should be going out and try to find those skills even in the communities that you're operating. Let's move on to the first point that you raise in your talk, resilience. And I want you to share with us the first moment, your first experience, when you went through something in this journey and you thought, man, in that moment, I had to be resilient. So I think for me, I left my job end of 2018. I was turning 30 in January. I was like 30, I'm rewarding myself with sabbatical, leaving corporate, I'm gonna run Corium. And so I think one of the things we were looking to was our retail migrations to now say that we want physical presence in chain stores. And that was something, you know, that we'd gone to meetings for and we had offers and we had um, a quite strong interest in Corium, but you realize that the business was not operationally ready for what you wanted. Got you. And that builds resistance, uh, resilience, right? When you become disappointed or when you have to delay what you thought you really wanted, that builds resilience. Because um, it's hard. Because it's hard. Um, and as a person, you'll first take it to your ego to say, Whew, okay, I'm, I'm not ready for this or this is not happening or, okay, and, and it will hit your ego first and you'll go through all those emotions and you, you rightfully must, but then it builds resilience to say that I'm still going to do it. 
you know? I'm not going to do it at the time I thought, or it's not going to happen at the time I thought, but I'm going to do it. Um, and that speaks to then the strong core, because I think to be an entrepreneur, you have to have a very strong core. We take knocks day to day, we take knocks in deals, you know, we take knocks maybe uh, when you send out proposals and things and things are, are rejected or you're not ready or people cannot fund you they feel that this is not viable or you know so we we take knocks as entrepreneurs and that's why i'm saying you will first take the ego knock where your emotions are going to feel disappointed and you're going to feel embarrassed or humiliated whatever it is but then you need to be resilient and it it brings me to then something i say quite a lot in either podcasts or interviews that i've done to say that you cannot run a business on ego decisions you cannot run a business on ego decisions when you're an entrepreneur you have to do what is best for the business you have to prioritize the business right so sometimes that is going to come with disappointment sometimes it's going to come with humiliation but it's the business that comes before your ego it's the business that comes before your personal glory you are building a business that's supposed to be sustainable and a business that's about the consumer and i think we get so lost in the source right yes. <laughs> that we forget that that entrepreneurship is about solving a problem for the consumer Okay. okay, we're, we're going to pause it there for a moment. Entrepreneurship is about solving the problem for the consumer. Park your ego. This is not so much about you. Love it from we. All right, we're going to take a short break. On the other side of this, we are going to be getting into the reinvention conversation because COVID-19 happened, right? And this wonderful lady was running a beautiful skin business. You go out into a store and you buy it, you jump into your car and go home and put it on. And suddenly you can't leave your house anymore. And now you're going to be on Zoom calls. So you still want to look good. How did she reinvent herself? Don't go away. Dad, it's got reverse camera. Come on. <laughs> so does your bank help get my startup off the ground? F&B does. Oh, okay. With the first business zero account. But you've got a job. Office hours, pay for my after hours. Ah, you mean side hustle. No, my business. And that's why I have a business account that has zero monthly account fee. All my swipes are free. Plus, I get data from F&B too. Wow. Wow is getting paid anyway. Work that hustle. I told you, it's not a hustle. It's a business. And that's why I'm with a business bank. Okay, I hear you. Does your bank help you start your business like that? Mine does. Welcome back, guys. And of course, we continue our conversation with Vui, the founder of Corium Skin Care. We're talking about the art of reinvention. Vui, final question from me before we go to the Q&A. &A. You're running, running your business. business. You've got, got a plan. plan. It's all going. going. And, and something, something in the world, world comes and kicks us all in the butt called COVID-19. What, what did it mean for your business and how do you reinvent to not only stay alive but also thrive in the future? So the first place we are hit is the supply side, right? because we deal a lot with natural oils, natural butters that have to be imported. So suddenly the things that you need to make the product that you sell, to make money, to pay yourself, to pay your staff, to live off, <laughs> is not coming. Crazy. Or it's stuck at the port for a number of weeks that is just wow. crazy to even mention. So then some of your best sellers are going to be out of stock for what, a few weeks? That means you're not making the amount of money you were making, but your overheads are still the same. You, you know, your cost structure is still the same. And your customers are losing confidence now because I'm looking for the stuff and it's, it's never there. And yes, and then they'll tweet or whatever, hey, when is this back in stock? And it's like, Phew, this is a failure of the business. So that's where we were hit the most on the, on the supplier side. Um, in terms of selling, we were able to still sell through our e-commerce channels because we're very strong on e-commerce, so that helped. I think when we went into winter, which is a peak season, and people were working from home and we we're now starting to to understand the pattern of how how much slower the, the supply and the raw materials are going to come that's when we started to hit a peak so i was lucky that in winter of 2020 i did very strong numbers because of the work from home culture uh -huh. so when people are working from home and in the zoom meeting you're going to go on to zando you're going to go into faithful to nature you're going to go on to take a lot and you're going to buy and for some reason, I'm not sure, I think someone needs to actually research the psychology of online shopping. When you do a transaction online, it doesn't feel like you're spending money. So as people were spending more time in front of their screens, as people were spending more time, you know, in front of the computer and contrived at home, we were seeing sales start to go up because of what we had built, uh, how we had built ourselves as an e-commerce business. So I think 
there was the terrible downside of not being able yeah. to, to meet demand fast enough. Yeah. But then once we learned our patterns, I think we were able to really right. tap into the trust we had built with our consumers to yeah. be able to then hit those e-commerce sales. Brilliant. 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 Let's, Let's pause, pause it there. there. Let's, Let's take your questions, questions ladies and gentlemen. And gentlemen please uh, keep in mind on YouTube and Facebook Live, you can throw into your, in your, all your questions onto the comment section. If you are streaming for free on our data free link, that's on our website, I'm an entrepreneur. .co.za. You can WhatsApp your questions as well, and we'll make sure I put them uh, to we the numbers online. But let me repeat it for you: zero seven eight three five zero zero seven six eight. Let's have all of your questions, and on Twitter at i a e s a. Please throw us your questions. Now let me go straight into the questions, and where I want to start, uh, Vui, is a question that was sent late earlier on um, from Makosim Simang. She's the one who stood up in Durban. And she, she wanted to ask this question. So we've asked her to ask it live from Durban once again, now that you're on the blue chair. Mam Hi, Andile. Go, Go for it, my sister. sister. I'm, I'm, in the, it, my sister. Yeah. I'm in the tourism industry. So we are highly affected by COVID. So we had to reinvent and pivot ourselves. But now my question is, how do we as a business gain that consumer confidence back into utilizing our services and products. Thanks. Brilliant question, Makosi. Over to you, Brilliant, Brilliant and very tough Brilliant. question. So Makosi's question speaks to environmental understanding, right? So the whole environment has changed. Um, the environment in tourism has changed. Disposable income of, you know, consumers has changed. So if I was taking maybe three holidays a year, maybe I didn't get my bonus. Perhaps I didn't get, you know, the sort of incentives I used to get pre-COVID. So now I'm spending a bit wiser. And something like tourism is a luxury spend for most people. So I would say to Makosi that she needs to go and look at how her environment has changed. So maybe instead of longer stays, people want to go for lunches. They want to go for spa dates. They want to go for game drives. You know, instead of, you know, going for romantic weekends away. Because that's too expensive. I no longer afford it. So she needs to look at how the consumer's behavior has changed and make herself appealing to the consumer. Absolutely. You know, so if I don't want a weekend break, but I still want a game drive, then offer game drive as a, you know, a standalone offering so that I can go drive in for the day, go for the game drive, go home. Absolutely. And I, I would add to what, what we're saying, saying and say to you, you uh, um, that the other innovation has got to be about how do you now provide, you know, um, products that work for now. And I'll give you an example. How about mixing some business and pleasure? A work from home trip where I also get to enjoy a holiday. So I go away to an establishment, it's got great Wi-Fi. I can take a, f a couple of meetings in the morning, but in the afternoon, my wife and I can go on a game drive and have a great dinner. Maybe the next day is chilled, maybe another day is work. Because now we're living in this blended work. So I do think there's some innovation, but you're right. With what has happened with COVID-19, it's gonna be difficult for people to trust that the places they go to are safe and indeed they won't go there and be infected. So perhaps safety is probably the other thing that you're going to have to make people comfortable. All right, let's move on to the next one. I've got Moby asking through our social media platforms, how does one realize that they now need to move away from what they're doing to doing something else? What determines the need to change direction in the business? How do I know? How do I know it is time? So I think this one is, is more of a head decision than a heart decision, right? Because if a business has been making losses, is, if a business is now starting to eat at your personal finances, if it's eating at your relationships, if the market size is shrinking, you know, sometimes the head has to then come before the heart and to say, I need to shut my doors. It could be temporarily, you know, it could be forever. It could be that the market need has totally changed. So I think sometimes it's, it's just a head decision where you, you would still love your business with everything that's in you, but it's just no longer making sense financially. It's no longer viable or feasible. And it's also now starting to, to, to affect either your mental, your emotional health and things like that. So I think there are times when you are going to have to walk away from a yeah. business and you need to sometimes just do it. And I mean, it sounds a bit callous, but yes. I think sometimes that's I just life. Totally. I mean, the, the other reason why it, it makes sense to do so is if you've tried everything you can and, and you free. really worked through and now that light at the end of the tunnel is now dimming, right? And you can see that no matter how much more effort I put in here, I don't believe that I'm going to change the fortunes. The best thing you can do for yourself is just stop. Just don't, don't do it anymore. 
Move on to something else that will excite you, where you'll see light at the end of the tunnel. Where you, because also, you know, we, 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 we live off the energy that's inside us. So if you're doing something that's depressing you all the time, it's a hell of a difficult to keep trying to make it work when you're clear that no matter how much I do, it's not likely to work. 100% correct. Absolutely. Let's, Let's move on. on. Uh, uh, Ronel Radame has an interesting question about breaking through um, into markets that may seem difficult. So the question is, how does one motivate small grassroots businesses in rural areas to innovate without all the resources and markets available? And how does small business, i.e. in townships, get access to market share in cities where there are so many retailers and wholesalers? And I guess this speaks to breaking into something that may seem impenetrable. And your business broke into a market. I mean, certainly when I go to the skincare aisle in any chemist, I'm thinking, man, look at these big brands. How did you do it and how, how can Brunel take those principles into kind of her side of things? I think that was such a layered question because there was also the geography part of yeah. the question where she said, if I'm in a rural area or a township, how do I break into, you know, um, a business in a developed, as a supposed part of town or a part of the region? So I think for me, everything in business, you start with your environmental scan. Um, you know, and maybe it talks to my background as a consultant, but you need to scan your environment. So she needs to understand her environment. Why does she believe that she cannot serve in the township or the rural area that she's in? Why does she believe that for it to be commercially viable, it needs to be in a city center or in an urban area? Because you may find that the need exists in the township or the rural area, just not in the sophisticated manner that it exists in the city. So I would say to her that she needs to just scan her environment and see how can she start with what she has around her, right? Um, so that was the one part of the question. There was a second part of the question. It was about township businesses also make into the cities, but I think the principles are the same. Let me pick up another question that's direct to you. It's coming from Luna Ngiwa. How did you find a reliable manufacturing partner? I know this is big for products, top businesses. Getting somebody who will do it right, reliable, deliver, fair price. How did you do it? Um, so with Corium, all of our manufacturing is outsourced, right? Um, to have you know the quality standards that we need and to have the sort of certification that we need especially going into a retail migration you just want those things to be sort of standardized um, and y we've changed so who's manufacturing now it was not who was manufacturing two years ago and that's because now of the scale of the business you know and the needs of the business so I think you need to uh, draw up a bullet point list for yourself what the th what are the things that you need from the manufacturer is it safety standards is it quickness? Is it cost saving? What are the most important things that you need so that you can find a manufacturer that is compatible to you? Because to go to someone who's going to say the minimum order quantity is 50,000 units, mm. when you're only doing 500 units a month, is no longer compatible to you. So you need to look at your shopping list and to create a shopping list of what the things are that you need from a manufacturer. So you might find that you don't need a manufacturer. Maybe mm. sometimes you need to just merge with, you know, someone else who's doing it at a smaller scale or, you know, it's, it's, it's not always so singular in terms of yeah. solution. Yeah. Got it, got it loud and clear. Duma Bhutia has a different, different question. And uh, I've certainly heard this question many times. Thank you for the initiatives. Thank you, Duma uh, How can one share and discuss details of a business venture without compromising confidentiality? The old, they're gonna steal my idea. I don't think any idea is absolutely new and absolutely original because we all live in the same world. We all notice the same gaps. Um, you know, we're all wanting to solve similar problems for the consumer. It's how you then tackle the problem that makes it unique to you and your value proposition. So I think, you know what, someone can steal your idea, but the execution can never be the same. So you need to protect yourself to sign an NDA. Yes, it's some sort of protection, but someone can still steal your idea, but they're not you. So you need to understand that sometimes part of the value proposition is you, the way that you would do it, Absolutely. right? Because you and I can both sell body butters. You and I can both sell milk. Yes. But how I would market and sell and communicate Absolutely. milk versus how you would do it is different. And that then becomes the value proposition between the two of us. So to worry about an idea being stolen is something that you don't have so much control over because at some point you have to share, whether it's with your consumers, whether it's with potential investors, whether you're looking for funding, you have to share. So you need to be confident that the way that you would do it is not how someone else would do it. And I think that then makes 
brilliant. makes it yours. Brilliant, brilliant. I totally yeah. agree with you. Uh, there's a question about scaling up using technology, but I think you've touched on it with uh, uh, the online stores earlier. Simba Mlambo runs a business called Ari Marketing, and he's saying, look, I'm still starting up uh, because of limited capital. I had to approach companies to be a reseller of their products and services. The difficult next step is getting potential clients to notice me, know and trust my business. May the panelists please address the subject of market penetration and how to get into the market. So seems like a sole trader, he's been selling other people's products, he wants to now to start selling his own skills. How do people notice me? How do people notice Korea? So I think it goes towards having a customer-centric model. Um, so with us, what helped is having strong testimonials and quite a customer-based model because um, with skin, which is different to technology, people want a relatability element of it. So they want to know that we used it, she had spots, it cleared her spots, or she felt this about the product, or she found it was effective and affordable. So with us, the customer centricity was very important towards penetrating the market because you need to build trust. So I'm going to go to the principal because I'm not in tech. I'm going yes. to go to the principal, which is yes. trust. So he needs to build a track record so that he can be trusted. So when he was a reseller, what are some of the things, what are some of the feedback that he got that he can then package and make um, it to be his value proposition to say that when I was a reseller, they said that, you know what, I'm good at selling. They said that I'm fast in terms of uh, delivery. They said X, they said Y, they said Z. So I believe that having those skills and having that feedback, I can now offer X. Got you. There's a, there's a question coming from, from Lee Bug on YouTube Live. And I guess it goes for anybody with a skill, right? So YouTube, uh, sorry, uh, Leebug is a creative, right? So he says, how does one bridge the gap between being a creative, so that's his skill, and being an entrepreneur, which I find interesting. How do you add the structure that Google referred to earlier on in her talk to aid the creative in you not to lose track? And in, in, I guess what he means is, I have a skill, and it could be anything, not just a creative, an engineer, a crea a, 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 an artist, it could be anything. How do I move from the ability to do the work, but the ability to build a business. Because those are two different things. And those are two different skill sets, right? Because entrepreneurship is a merger of lots of generalist skill sets. So he would have maybe a deep technical skill versus, you know, what a, a horizontal, um, what's it called, a horizontal bouquet of skills. So he, he, he might find that he needs to partner with someone. He might find that he needs to just start doing it on a small scale yeah. so that he can learn those skills in terms of pricing. Um, when I say that it's 150 rand an hour, do I feel that the time that I've devoted to making this logo is actually worth 150, yeah. you know? So that you can only do through practice and through starting to do it. And that's how you learn things like pricing. That's how you learn that actually it takes me four hours to do a logo. So it's not 150, you know, it's <laughs> 150 so times four. Yeah. Um, so that's really my advice to him. And I hope I've answered you the question. Him. I, mean, I think to, to add to what we are saying, there's nothing wrong with bringing in people with the skills you don't have. And I think that's been a very big part of your input this morning is just sharing, talk to other people, bring in other skills. And you don't have to employ them, you don't have to have a lot of money. People give you their skills in return for some money because they too are entrepreneurs. So an accountant, a bookkeeper, somebody that's got some business acumen, you the creative, bring in somebody else to help you and that will suddenly help you take your creativity and make it a business. Finally, we have a question all the way from KwaZulu-Natal in Durban to the team over there. I'm told we've got Cindy Machola. Hello, Cindy. Hi, AK. Um, my name is Cindy Machola. I'm in the fashion industry. Um, as uh, you have mentioned um, earlier, earlier that you'd had, uh, there's a point where in business you you you, you having you have to close down the doors and uh, detach detach yourself um, um, from the business. I've had had to go through that and decide that I need to close the business and and mentally and emotionally detach myself from the business. Mm. Now my question is, how um, how does how did she keep her head above the water during this, um, uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, the COVID-19? And uh, what, what are the three points that she would um, uh, give, that she had to look at the structure that she had to uh, 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 keep um, um, uh, looking at that would have help her keep the head above the water during uh, 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 um, uh, uh, the pandemic? Thank you. Well done, Cindy. Before I even go to... To Vui, I want to say congratulations for making such a difficult decision. It is not easy 
to, to close down a business. In fact, I think it's more difficult to close down a business than it is to start one. So well done in making the decision and executing on it. Right. Now, let's get you back on your feet. Fui. So three questions. So I, I just want to repeat the question back because she said she, she had to close down the business, yeah. right? Because it was no longer viable or feasible. So she's saying three points to, to keep your head above. Is this now when you're closing down the business or you've closed the business? To stay going, to keep going. How, How do you, you make, make sure, sure that, that as you traded through the pandemic, you kept your head above the water. You kept going, you know. So she's looking for some tips of how do you just persevere? How do you stay resilient? Back to the points you raised earlier. Correct. Um, so then I'm going to go to also an earlier point about then the self-belief and having the strong core. Um, so I really hope that one day you can reopen the business and you can share your passion with the world because I think that's important. And I think also to echo Andile, well done on taking what is such a difficult decision. So you need that strong core to be able to say that because the business has failed, I'm not a failure. Um, and I think that's important. Um, and also I want to say hallelujah to that. Because if the business has failed, you, you are, are not, not the failure. failure. It's okay. just the business. Correct. And you can modify your idea and come back in a new way, or you can come back when the market reinvents itself. Um, so that is, 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 is quite important. For me now, this is now a personal one, to have some sort of faith-based belief. Absolutely. I think, um, See, the hallelujah was well placed. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so now you got me in a moment. So to have some sort of a faith-based belief, because yeah. it's hard. I mean, you, you've had to shut your doors. Maybe you've got bills now. There's people, you know, yeah. knocking. To, so to have something that you go to yeah. and you say, this is my sense and my place of restoration. Absolutely. That is so important. And thirdly, to, to start to then, the head, to start to have the practical plans, to say if I had debts, or, or how am I going to, to pay them? You know, if there were things that were outstanding, am I going to sell furniture from the old business? You know, am I going to downscale my home? What am I, go am I going to refine my spending habits? What is, what is it that I need to do gotcha. to keep myself alive? Because it's also important that, you know, you eat, you, you know, that you can meet your gotcha. basic needs as a human. So I think those are the three points. I would, I would add, add one more about, about just being realistic about your situation, particularly to creditors and people you owe money to, right? So don't be shy to go to them. So let's say you owed people 100,000 rand and it was 10 people at 10 grand each. Go to each one of them and say, I know I owe you 10 grand each. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pay you 100 rand a month, even as small and stupid as that. And you just stick with it because what are they gonna do? Well, they're gonna run away, how are they gonna get their money? So people will be, will be patient with you if you are genuine with them and if you tell them the situation and you stick by it, trust me, they'll wait because they too, by the way, because of this pandemic, are going through their own nonsense as well. So don't, be, don't, be too, don't beat yourself up too much about it. There's one more thing I want to tell you what Richard Branson said once is the reason why companies, that's what, the reason why governments started companies and PTYs and LTDs is to remove the entrepreneur away from the failure of the company because it is almost expected that businesses will fail. So you can be able to pick up and move on because X PTY LTD didn't work. Well, I can start Y PTY LTD. So don't give up, my sister. That's the way it works. Failure is just what we do as entrepreneurs. All right, we're going to take one more from Durban. I've got Sponello. Hello, Sponello. Sponello, Mr. Andele. Okay, my name is Sponello. As you mentioned, uh, I've got a question here. As my as, you, as, as your guest has mentioned that he, she started a business while she was working. Well, as me too, uh, I'm still working. Uh, I've got a, a degree in public management. I'm doing supply chain. So I've got a business that deals with civil engineering. So I started my business 2018, and then there's a online uh, tool that I use to market my business. So the number shows that my business is growing. Last year, I was about to resign because of the projection that was showing that my business is growing. So the problem is that I don't have the team that's going to assist me in terms of doing the cost estimation, don't have the skill, but I'm trying by my best to do some estimation. If the project is big, so those projects, uh, I'm losing those projects because of the skill that I don't have. So when I go out to get some help, people, they want to charge me before the project has been awarded to me. So so I just want to ask the question, how do I build a team that's going to assist me while I don't have enough funds to pay them at the moment, but the numbers show that the demand is growing and then big projects, are, big projects are coming, but at the moment I don't have funds to pay them. 
brilliant questions, Bonnie. I love it, my friend, because we can help you in some practical ways. Let me give you an opportunity first. Okay, um, so Swanil is saying that my business is growing. Um, I need more skills, but I can't pay them. So I think now you need to look at uh, funding solutions. Uh, if you do have a contract to purchase order or something, um, there are, there's CIFA, there's a lot of agencies that can help you if you're saying that you do know for a fact that you're going to get that money. So it sounds like he's saying he's being awarded the contract. Yep. So in instances like that, you can go and borrow money and then you'll pay your skills through that. And I think that's important. What is, what is not good is to go and get skills of contracts or purchase orders or a demand that you have not captured as yet. Yep. So that I am cautioning strongly about. If the contract is not in your hand, if the purchase order is not in your hand, if you don't have that commitment, don't go and get debt on an expectation. Please don't. Um, so I think that's my advice okay. to him. So Manolo, I would add one, you very clear about the fact that you need help at the time you're pitching for the business. You probably will be able to pay if and when you win the work. So your challenge is you, you don't have the money to pay for the costing. The first thing I would do is you're welcome to email us info at amanentrepreneur.co.za. The team will get your email to me and I'm gonna find someone in Durban to come and help you with costing, okay? Somebody with an engineering background who probably runs a business like yours who will come and help you because you only need to be trained. You just need someone to show you how to do it. You do it a few times, you might make some mistakes. You can be able to call that person get you to, to get you better at it. After a while, my brother, you'll be able to do it yourself. It's not rocket science. You just don't know, that's all. So email me, I'll sort you out. Thank you. Fui, are you happy? Oh. Um, I'm happy. Thank you so much for the platform. I feel, I feel like we've spoken a lot. <laughs> it does, right? uh, we've, we've said a lot, but I hope, I mean, in everything that we've said, I hope that it can be broken down into practical steps and nuggets, right? And I'm hoping that the delivery of what we did today is able to assist someone who's watching or someone who will watch this at a later stage. And so thank you very much for the thank platform. You. Thank you. I'm a big fan of your work. Thank you. I'm a big, big fan, fan of your resilience. resilience. You're like Ms. Resilience to me, okay? You just keep going no matter what and you find a way. What you did during COVID-19 and what you will continue to do, I only see big things. So thank you very much. Guys, if you don't know what I'm talking about, coriumskincare.co.za, go hook yourself up and get in with the best skincare brand in the country. Matsi, I want to thank you, my new TV superstar, Oprah Winfrey of Entrepreneurship. I love you. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, AK, and a wonderful segment. I think, guys, we need to say her name. Wu Yi, you are Gold's girl. Say her name, Korean Skincare. This is the future of our country. So inspired. I mean, she only started her business when she turned at 30. She only started her business when she turned 30. When are you going to start your business? When are you going to take that leap of faith? When are you going to believe in yourself for once? Because we did. So we are so proud of you, girl. And I think um, to tap onto one of the comments that were made, um, there's a lady called Ayanda Bikicha. I remember we mentioning on Twitter that she would love to follow her passion of beauty. And I asked her what's stopping her. So I'm so impressed with her story and her success. So we thank you so much, darling, for just keeping on, keeping on and just doing it. You did it. And I encourage all you entrepreneurs to just do it. If you have to quit that job, just do it, uh, but be responsible about it. <laughs> well, we are now coming towards an end, and I'm quite sad because we've had such a wonderful morning, an inspiring morning. But as our parting shots, we are going to Pearls of the Hustle. So all of us as entrepreneurs know the importance of selling, right? It's the first line of every income statement. It's the life of every business. Without sales, you don't really have a business. But I know how disappointed we can be when we give it our all to sell our product or service and our client just doesn't take it up. Shukri Tofi talks about the importance of building relationships with potential clients and understanding that it takes time. So I think as a business person, and particularly as a salesperson, you need patience, right? And so I think first and foremost, you have to believe in what you're selling um, and you have to believe in why you wake up every morning. Um, and something that you have to remember is that people on average buy from you the fifth time you sell to them. And so again, I think very often people sort of uh, get angry and they say, enough, I've sent this guy my proposal for the second time and he, still doesn't need it. 
well, there's probably things, budgetary, internal politics, things happening, maybe current relationships that he has. And so I think that there's a level of patience and there's a level of perseverance required in business. And I can tell you that, that, you know, um, I can have a conversation with someone today and, um, and they can often only buy from you five years later. And so you have to sort of be seeing your investment in these relationships as at least medium to long term um, sort of investments. And you have to say, well, yeah, there are certain opportunities where I'd like to turn it around very quickly, um, but I'm in this for the long run. So have what you do tethered to your purpose and so that people call you and they say, hey, you know the conversation we had five years ago? I'm now ready to have that conversation. And then you'd be able to benefit from that. And so, yeah, I think people need to realize um, the, the time game that they're playing with respect to their particular relationships with people um, and show more patience. Do you see the sad face? Because we really have come to the end of a beautiful, beautiful show. This is only the beginning. This is the first I am an entrepreneur summit that we'll be hosting, but certainly looking forward to more and more to come. Entrepreneurship is a lifeblood of our country. Entrepreneurs are the creators. Entrepreneurs are the innovators. We need to start seeing entrepreneurship as key and core to growing our economy. For more information, on everything that we've done today, um, the, the guests that we've had, and also other digital content that we have, we'd really encourage you to go onto our website, which is www.iamanentrepreneur.co.za. We want you to subscribe. We want you to be part of this tribe. Our next summit is going to be hosted um, on Saturday, the 15th of May. So it's gonna be a monthly summit. We're gonna have exciting, exciting panelists, exciting entrepreneurs, and also on our social media platforms, feel free to tell us what it is that you want us to talk about, because we are here for you, we are here to empower you, and we are here to enrich you. We really thank you, thanking all our guests, um, our guests in, in Durban, and everybody else that tuned in. I know my mother in uh, Kestel in the Free State, um, has been busy on social media. So I'm glad that she was able to join us. And, you know, she's somebody that has inspired my very own entrepreneurial journey. So thank you, Mom, for uh, uh, zooming in this morning. Um, and so we are a very generous crowd. We love entrepreneurs and we have a competition. So to stand a chance of winning a laptop and I am an entrepreneur hamper, be sure to complete our survey. If you're watching YouTube and you're on Facebook, check the comments, um, um, the comments section for the link. Um, and if you're streaming via our data-free platform, we will be sending you an email. Friends, entrepreneurs, you rock. Keep on going. Make those risks. Take those decisions. South Africa is waiting for you. Until next time, we from I Am An Entrepreneur team would like to send a massive shout out to all of you for believing in yourself. We thank you and we can't wait to see you till next time. Hey, does your bank give you a guide on how to run your business? Yep, it's on Fundaba, which puts all I can learn about business right here. Fun what? Fundaba. It's proper help on how to run my business. It's free on my FNB app, so I can learn on the go. Oh, like little tips? I wouldn't call learning how to get my pricing right to turn profits in one year little. Mm, what's the catch? No catch. They just want my business to do well. Hmm, that's really something. Does your bank put a business coach in your hand? Mine does.